Week six, business to business. Now, there's a caveat we need to declare here, is that with most of the other areas, major areas of marketing, we have a subject or we have a specialization or we have something. In marketing, there are two distinct schools of research. There's business to consumer and there's business to business. And we are a business to consumer school. So our research domain and our teaching domain is in the business to consumer. So we look at the end user, we look at the customer, the client, we look at the societal impact, but we don't tend to look at the partner and we don't have as much work in the business to business domain. Consequence of which is it's a specialization for us, consumer focus, but it does mean that there are, if this is your area of interest, you're going to need to provide your own, create your own value, do your own background reading. So functionally, business to business is the buying, selling and exchange of goods for the production of the offering that has value. So the idea here is that there is a back end to marketing practice. There's the front end, the idea of the engagement with the consumer. So the stuff that we're familiar with as consumers that we can see when we're out on the roads, the billboards, the bus shelter advertising, versus the business to business side, which is the creation of elements that feed into those products. Now, if you come through Canberra Airport, you will actually see a fair bit of business to business advertising in Canberra Airport, particularly defense contractor business to business advertising. But the best way to think about it is the consumers will count as the gold miners and we're the ones when business to business, you're selling the shovels and the mining supplies to the stores that are servicing the frontier towns. With this focus in mind, then this opens up a range of different challenges and opportunities in business to business. First of all is it's a far more complicated and complex decision-making process. You have a, and we will deal with a couple of those challenges shortly, but quite often it's a multi-user decision. There's, if you are provisioning supplies to a firm who's going to make a product, you also may be one of many supplies in the pipeline. So if you are looking at McDonald's as the business to business relationships, it's not just the hamburger components, the meat, the buns, the lettuce, tomato, cheese, the sauces, the coffee, the coffee machines, the electricity, the cleaning equipment. You think about everything that goes on behind the stage. And it's even down to things like the servicing of the equipment used for the cooking equipment, the equipment used for the refrigeration, all the paperwork, all the things that go in the tills, all the software. The back end is far more complicated, and in particular, where you start getting interaction effects of a business to business company engaging a, another business, but also going direct to the market as a business to consumer firm. So there are a range of different uh, channels and distributions challenges. And this will be picked up again when we look at retailing and we look at distribution. However, fundamentally, business to business marketing is marketing. This means target markets still count. Segmentation, targeting and positioning are vital in the business to business world because sometimes you only need one client. If you are the catering firm that has the catering contract to supply Qantas, you are a national-based provider. You are a large organization. You have one client, and that's Qantas, and you only need one, one client because that's Qantas. There are also some challenges here than the fact that in business to business, you may be provisioning both competitors or multiple competitors in the marketplace. So there will be a certain level of pressure on you to cut supply or prioritize one 
of your customers over another. Plus, there's a whole range of discussions around the distribution networks and the ways in which business to business as a facilitator, as a skill set and a service set can create value for themselves, but also value for their clients. So let's talk about a couple of the key challenges. One of them is scale. When we're talking business to business, we are talking high volume. Sometimes it can be much smaller. You can be a small business that provides business to business services. Again, if you're an accountant who provides accounting services to local small medium enterprises, that's a small, you're small scale. But one of the challenges that frequently happens is that consumers in the business to business sense, so your customers, quite often want to purchase in bulk. They want en masse. A customer, a business to consumer customer, will want 10, 20 at most, 30 perhaps. Then your business to business customer comes in and basically expects to deal with two to 300 customers. So they're looking at three to four to 5,000 units because they will have where one customer is going to need, and let's just pick a thing. It's a big catering day. One customer is buying 12 cups of coffee. If you are the firm providing the coffee and you have 10 of those customers, that's a lot of coffee. So you're going to need to purchase in bulk. You're going to be working at scales. You also have these challenges where you get a small provider who has a niche market in a business to business and runs into the challenge of scaling. We mentioned in the ethics, in conscious marketing, in deliberate choices, because growth is not the only option available to you, in a business to business environment, you may find that you can't scale or rather you shouldn't scale. Exclusivity of contract, one or two small or one or two orders that you can meet effectively and efficiently for one or two clients may be better than having 10 or 20 clients. So you've got to really think about scaling. It's a huge issue in the business to business world. Timeframes as well. You are looking at much longer relationships. You're looking at the provision of supplies over time. Things can start with transactions, particularly if you're looking at a retailing or a manufacturing event. Chances are if the product goes well, they'll want more. If you are creating a component part for a particular product, say you're making screens for an iPhone, you're going to want to provision enough of them that the firm's not going to want to stockpile them. Like, as you're moving through the manufacturing line, so there's a lot of things in terms of supplier, buyer integration, a lot of distribution channel work, but most of the time, you are thinking in terms of an ongoing, longer term relationship that will have ebbs and flows of benefits and benefits. Over time, it should balance out, but there can be periods where one side gains more than the other, as long as it levels out on average. Now, in terms of bringing business to business theory back into the rest of what we've covered in the subject so far, this really does light up a couple of areas of the AMA definition. It is the partner. So when we talk about offerings that have value for client, customer, partner, and society at large. This is the area that's covered by partner. That said, the client customer aspect is also rather key. In a business to business relationship, you're, as the business, you're going to be the customer. You will be, you set up a small printing and photocopy shop just on the edge of campus to help out students with those last minute deadlines where they need physical hard copies for things. You're buying paper in, you are the customer. The people who are using your paper are the client. So the decisions you make, you're making as a proxy purchaser for them. And you're making these decisions on their behalf. Same for delivery and exchange. This is where we start looking at the business to business aspect tends to be the mechanisms that get us the exchange to take place. 
you go to the store, you tap your swipe card against the terminal, a whole lot of business to business transaction takes place in order for the money to come out of your account and eventually make its way down to the account of the people who are selling you the goods, whilst you immediately take the goods and clear out of the store. Supply lines, transactions and intermediaries are a critical part of business to business. Now, one of the things about the B2B market is that it is massive, but it also tends to be something that as consumers, we don't need to necessarily see. So this is sort of like, if you are interested in going to business to business uh, from an entrepreneurship perspective, there are a lot of options here. Manufacturers, resellers, major institutions, the Australian National University and its relationships with its contractors, with its suppliers. It's a major business to business transaction, basically clearing house. But the two that kind of get overlooked a little bit, which I want to just make certain that you're thinking about and you're aware of, is the outsource skill set and the marketplace providers. Now, the marketplace providers, eBay is one of them, but things like Fiverr, uh, where you can hire a set of skills, where there's a brokerage that connects you as a client to skill providers. Same for outsourcing, where if you take up an accounting degree, if you set yourself up as a private accountant, or you set up as a lawyer, you are going to be in a business to business transaction if you are dealing with other companies rather than dealing with end customers, rather than dealing with so the business to consumer side. So there's a lot to explore and look into here. And as I said, it's the back end of the marketing process. It's what underpins the distribution channel. And there's a couple of elements in here that I do want to sort of briefly mention. And one of them is the concept of the white label uh, production, and a little bit around just-in-time provision. So the notion of the white label is the idea of providing unbranded goods and services that can be rebranded. So you're basically selling a product that can be unsold as another product. And we see this a lot around the provision of food services, around raw materials, but there's also a huge online market for print-on-demand services, which things like Cafe Press allow you to put your own branding on materials. They've bought it in bulk. They're handling the manufacturing. But if you were to then set up a reselling service where you would custom design materials, present this stuff to an end client without them knowing that, hey, it had been printed by uh, print Press or Cafe Press or Zazzle, then they provide you a white label service. It's a really interesting area where you can go use and you can look into this as, again, an entrepreneurship plan of finding someone who's providing the unlabeled goods that you can put your brands and your materials on to be the reseller and you make your currency through the use of branding, positioning and aftermarket support. Now, in terms of comparisons to business to consumer, there's one key one I want to draw your attention to. And this is the business to business decision process when compared to the business to consumer process. There are a number of similarities. There are some differences because in B2B, you have a needs recognition but you tend to do product specifications, and those product specifications can be precise. In order to provide certain workshops, I need a number of Lego bricks, those and I can tell you the numbers, the specifications, the type, the colors, I'll have detail. It won't be, oh, I guess, a couple of kilos of stuff. It'll be down to detail. Now, if I was doing it as a full business to business approach, perhaps would do a call for tenders. I would then look at, okay, I need people to provision a number of services for me. Then having called for tenders, got bids in, 
start negotiating, getting the specifications, get things down to detail, and then produce the, uh, well, basically provide the goods, but also assess that both parties, that we are meeting specification, and that this ongoing transaction is in our best interests. But in terms of loose crossover between the two areas, one of the things to consider is that there is always an argument in the marketing literature that this element in the middle, product specification, the call for tenders, and the proposal analysis slash supplier selection is a rational decision process. But functionally, a bunch of people who use these types of processes in their business to consumer transactions are also going to be the kind of people who'll be hanging out back here. We know that supplier selection can be done on a motive basis, on friendships, on personal selling, and as such, it's not necessarily in reality the cut and dried consumers, emotive, irrational, business, logical. It's not necessarily that clean. So it's always worth considering if you find yourself in the business to business market, the personal contact and the personal touch will start evoking the business to consumer style decision making processes. The other thing that we want to briefly draw your attention to in terms of the head to head comparisons is the way in which purchasing takes place in the consumer world against the business to consumer world, or consumer business to business, there are a number of influences in the B2B spectre. Gatekeepers are an important one. There are people whose job it is is to stop purchases from unauthorized sources. When you have a preferred supplier, then your finance office will be and your legal office and your contract office, people who aren't going to use the product, people who haven't gone out to select the product, but people who are going to say, nah, sorry, can't transact with this group, go get a different quote, go get a different product. There'll also at times be people who make the, hey, we need to make a purchase. Hey, we're running low on supplies. It's not the person who uses the photocopier, it's the person who monitors the photocopier. It could be the IT department goes and realizes that they're about to time expire a series of licenses. They are not the person who uses the software. They won't be the people buying the software. They won't be the ones making the decision. They'll just be the ones initiating the process saying, annual license subscriptions have come up. Are we renewing? The decider says yes, no. And that can be a manager. That can be a financier who then gives the approval, the yay nay signal to the buyer, assuming the gatekeepers are satisfied. All of this takes place and eventually the person who has to actually use the software is the end user. Which is why sometimes when you're at your job and you're thinking, how the, why do we have the thing that's in front of us? It's because the people who are making the decisions are not necessarily the people who will be living with those decisions. And we have a little bit of this in the provision of higher education, particularly around the idea that the timetabling department gets to initiate, oh, courses are being run, we're expecting this many. They will then decide what rooms. Some of that will get, there's a little bit of gatekeeping in terms of what we're allowed to do, what we're allowed to request. We can't, there are certain policies we have to adhere to. But at the end of the day, we're the teaching staff and the students, we have the least say in this whole thing. Uh, and frequently, whether, particularly students, you're the ones who find out at the absolute end of the decision process, but you're the ones who are going to be using the room. So it's a business to business transaction. There's a whole bunch of other people who get to make the decision. And then we find ourselves in 7-Eleven Barry Drive because that's what someone several rungs up the tree has decided is the optimal deployment. And based on their calculations, the resources, available rooms, projected number of students, and position of the subject in people's flow through their degrees, 
10 o'clock on a Monday morning off campus might be the optimum location. And it is, in fact, a good decision that's been done by a whole series of evidence-based uh, and evidence-informed decision-making processes that as the user we're not conversant with, but the initiator, the influencers, the buyers, they know what's going on. The gatekeepers are stopping us from going, well, why don't we hold it down at the pub? OK, we can't hold it at the pub, not enough capacity. So there are good reasons for there to be infrastructures, there to be organizational knowledge, there to be these different processes that differ from how we deal as consumers. So to recap, business to business, it's an aspect of marketing. There's a lot of it that goes on, but it's not an area of uh, research or focus for us at the ANU. We're a business to consumer school. So this has been a brief highlights package. If you are interested in knowing more about B2B, it will be up to you to go on so that journey of self-discovery and personal development and personal research. Uh, and however, that said, if you are going into the provision of services and you intend to consult to firms, strongly recommend looking into it because that's going to be a skill set that will be optimal to have in the toolkit.